By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back at the Often Troll Cup. We have reached the top eight of this epic tournament held in Leeuwarden, the Netherlands. And in this top eight, we're going to have a true clash of two powerful decks. We have Gijsbert sitting on the left. He's a player from the Netherlands. He's playing uh, a deck that I've called Sol Canars Troops. It's uh, blue, it's black, it's red. It's looking very fierce. It's got, you know, your your very strong creatures, Surrender Befreeds, Hippies, Sedges, all that it's in this deck. And he is taking on Vil Sadi. Vil Sadi comes from Finland and he's playing a blue-white control deck with some beef. He's playing the Mahamoti, he's playing the Sarah Angel. It's kind of like the deck, but then his win con is really creature-based, which I kind of like. But before I start with the deck decks, because I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also skip that section. I know some people enjoy going to the games first and then check the decks, for example. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on MTG Games and that'll take you straight to the games of this top 8 match. And also in the description below, you can find more information about the rules and the Often Troll Cup. For example, if you want to get in touch with the organizers, you've got a link to their Facebook page and their Instagram. So maybe you want to join next year? Check the description below to find that contact info. Okay, for now, I'm going to start with the deck of the player on the left, Gijsbert. So let's take a look at his Solkanar's Troops. And here we see the deck of Gijsbert. So I've called it Solkanar's Troops because he's playing blue, black, and red, right? Those are the three colors that he's playing. And he's also playing with these three beautiful legendary creatures. Maybe start with those creatures. So Solkanar the Swamp King, a legendary creature demon that has Swamp Walk. And whenever a player casts a black spell, you gain a life. And it's also a 5-5 five, five for five mana. So this is just a good creature, but actually the other two are surprisingly okay as well. We've got Gwendolyn D. Gorgie, which is one blue, two black, and one, to, uh, one red to cast. For a legendary creature, it's now a human rogue. Uh, you can tap her, target player discards a card at random, activate only during your turn. So it's kind of like a disrupting scepter in creature form. And she's also a 3-5. So you get a 3-5 for 4, which is good. You know, the only drawback with these legendary creatures, or of course that mixed mana that you need. You need to have good mana fixing if you're playing these. Then we also have Tetsuo Umezawa, who is only 3 mana for a 3-3. Again, good value, but you got to have your blue, your black, and your red to cast him. And then you uh, it kind of has this Royal Assassin ability. Blue, black, black, and red, and tap. Destroy target tapped or blocking creature. So that blocking clause also makes it pretty good. Um, and it says Tetsuo Umezawa can be the target of aura spells, right? So you cannot play a control magic on the Tetsuo, right? I think that's the most relevant thing and you cannot play a paralyzed we also see paralyzed quite a lot but in this matchup i think we're going to see a lot of swords so you can just sorts tetsuo that's uh, that's no problem and then when we look at the rest of the deck it is pretty obvious right you just put the best cards in your deck of those colors so we see the four surrender befreeds the four hypnotic specters and the four set trolls those are just the best creatures in those colors uh they give you a lot of value for a relatively cheap uh mana cost that's what i'm trying to say the problem, of course, I always kind of find is that Hypnotic Spectre is too black, which is kind of tough, right? You got to have that mana base. In general, the mana base is going to be very important. If you have a Blood Moon against this deck, it's going to be tough. But I think in this matchup, there is no Blood Moon. So that's definitely good news for Gijsbert. And on the left side are actually two of my favorite creatures that he's put in his deck. Juzam Jin, which is just a poster boy of old school magic. And then the other poster boy, Shiva Dragon. Like I remember ripping over open revised packs, always hoping to find that Shivan. I didn't care for a dual land. I just want to have like Shivan Dragon, Mahamoti Jin, you know, the big boys of magic. So it's always cool to see those cards in a deck, especially in a top eight match. Of course, we're going to see all the power cards here. We're going to see Demonic Tutor Mind Twist. There's one Terror in here, Main, which is quite nice. Uh, we see some, uh, some Lightning Bolts. And of course, we're going to see the Blue Power in here and the Brain Geyser in here. So I think... You know, the cards in this deck, they're, they're pretty obvious, right? If you have all the old school cards to your disposal, you would probably kind of pick these cards if you go for these colors. But what I really like about it is that Gijsbert also went with the legendary creatures. I think that kind of, that gives this deck personality, which I which I really enjoy. I love it when, when a player puts something of himself in a deck. I think that's super cool. Anyway, this is the deck of Gijsbert. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Vil Sari. 
And here we see the deck of Veal. So this is kind of like the deck, right? It's got all those control opponents that make that deck so good. We see the Jam Day Tomes, the Balances, Counter Spells, Swords to Plowshares, the Blue Power. We even see a Moat in here. We see a Wrath of God. I think Wrath of God in his deck is quite good because it goes really well with the Mishra's Factories and also the creatures that he's playing for Sarah Angels and two Mahamotis, they're like fatties, right? So early in the game, you can just cast your Mahamoti, wipe, uh, sorry, cast your Wrath of God, wipe the board, and then you can cast your Mahamoti. And the nice thing about Wrath of God is remember, the creatures cannot regenerate. So those set trolls, they won't survive the Wrath. So I think Wrath of God could be, could play, I'm saying could, but could play a pretty big role in this matchup like a well-timed wrath is going to be quite nice the moat is probably not going to do that much since only the set trolls are the only like uh, ground creatures in the deck of Geisbert so probably after game one he's going to board that out um yeah if we look at the rest of the deck it's really kind of like uh, the deck um what I'm loving about it though is that he wants to win through combat damage which I like I love combat so it's nice to see the four Sarah Angels and the two Mahamoti so he wants to control the game and then when he's got card advantage going and he does what the deck wants to do and what a control deck usually wants to do, he controls the whole board, he's drawing more cards, he's probably wiped out all the threats of his opponent, he's got a counter spell in hand, and then when he's got enough mana, like eight or eight or nine or something, he's gonna cast his Sarah Angel with, with counter backup to protect it, and then he's gonna like slowly kill us. Well, slowly, Sarah Angel is a four four, so in five turns it's over, but then he's gonna start killing his opponent. Of course, in the meanwhile, he does have access to Mitra's factory. So whenever there's like an opening, he's probably just going to hit him for two. I don't think he's going to do that too often because you really don't want to lose uh, your Mitra's factory to a bolt or to any kind of artifact land removal uh, because you really want to keep that tempo up. This is a deck that needs a lot of mana that is a control deck. So this deck is not going for the quick win. This deck doesn't mind if a game takes long. Remember, top eight is not timed anymore. We saw the Swiss where you could only play 50 minutes, but now once he's reached top eight, it's actually a good thing for the deck because these decks, they want to take their time. They're in there for the long game. And then when we kind of try to look back at the deck of Geisbert, his deck is more aggressive, right? So I think in this matchup, Geisbert is really the aggressor with like cheaper creatures. And if he can get the right mana base, he can get them out early and kind of try to stab at, uh, at Veal's deck. And then of course for Veal, the longer the game takes, the better it is. So he's gonna try to counter the first threats away, sorts the first threats away, and then kind of, you know, work on his on his control. And then once he's got control, like I said, he's gonna play out his bigger creatures and try to win the game with that. I mean, it's that simple, right? In the meanwhile, it's gonna probably draw a lot of cards, etc., etc. So this is the deck of Veal. We looked at the deck of Geisbert. We're ready. I think this is going to be an exciting match with two decks that have different strategies. So that's always cool. So let's go to the top eight. Game number one. Here we go. So on the right, we have Veal. He's from Finland. He's playing a the deck type deck with uh, Sarah Angels and Mahamoti. So it's mainly blue and white. He's taking on Geisbert, who's on a deck that I've called Solkanar's Troops. It's blue, black and red. And he's got Solkanar, the Swamp King. And some more legendary creatures. Hopefully we get to see them in this matchup. He also has a lot of... Ooh, look at this opening, by the way, by Geisbert with the time walk. That is really good. Taking an extra turn. If he can find another black, he could cast an hypnotic specter here. Or, of course, a surrender Befrit. He's also playing with the playset of Setch Troll. So, for him, three mana really means the start of casting some of those creatures. And he will get to see the surrender. And no sorts to plowshares yet. By Veal, he's playing a Felwer Stone, has a lot of mana available, tapping four. There's a Jam Day Tome and a pass. Only one card in hand for him, though. Geisbert taking a damage, but of course he can attack Veal here for three points, putting him on 17. That's exactly what he does. He's not animating the factory, so he probably has a four mana option. Interesting, playing the Satch, he wants to keep that regeneration mana open. That... I guess, well, you know, you don't have two mana to also animate the factory and play the set. So, so this uh, this play makes sense. What I wanted to say is that, you know, Veal, of course, having swords to plowshares, playing white, so he doesn't really matter about the regeneration clause. He's playing with a moat that could stop the set troll. There's a pass, but this is a little bit problematic here for Veal. He really needed the swords here. Maybe he's got one in hand. Remember, it's an instant, so he can play it during combat as well. But we see Geisbert here on 18, and... Potentially, he could do a swing here for eight if he animates the factory. That would be huge. That would put Veal on nine. There's an attack for six. 
What are we going to see? We're going to see a sword here. That sword was really needed by Veal to kind of stop the bleeding. Just taking three from the set, dropping to 14. He's got a lot of mana. What is he going to do? There is a Sangir Vampire 4-4, four, four, so more muscle hitting the board. Veal only two cards in hand. There's a counter spell there, but he was tapped out again. That's the thing when you're under pressure, you usually have to tap out, and the counter spells are just not that good. He does need another Swords here. Finding a Plains, he has one counter spell in hand, and he Swords to Plowshares. That is really good. And he's playing this main probably because, you know, he doesn't want to give Geisbert a chance to maybe draw into a counter spell here. So I understand this decision by Veal to just cast it in his own turn. There's the attack for five, so really putting on the pressure here. And this is what I talked about in the deck deck as well. The deck of Veal is really more controlling. The deck of Geisbert is more aggressive in this matchup. Let's see what Veal can do. Two cards in hand, drawing an extra card. That maybe the Tome can, can help him finding the answers. This is something, at least the blocker, not for now at least, because he can only make it into a 2-2. Well, he can trade it with the Factory, of course. There's the animation, I think, of the Mishra's Factory. No, there's a Soul Ring. Now he's animating the Factory, he's gonna attack. I wonder if Vil is gonna block or gonna take five, gonna go to four. It's risky, because you are playing against a deck that has access to red, and of course four puts you open to a potential side blast. So he is blocking, and I understand that move, but before blocks are declared, there's that Bolt and the counter spell, so they're gonna trade. And there's the hit for three, so Vil's gonna drop here to six. So the counter spell did come in handy eventually. But there's still that pressure. Ooh, there's a Chaos Sword, but of course, Geisbert can regenerate, so that's not the card he's looking for. Counterspell in hand, Chaos Sword in hand, and think of mana, exactly. There's the Underground Sea and a pass turn. Geisbert can swing in here, put him on three. That's exactly what he does. I wonder if he's gonna put some more pressure on the table. Tapping four, yeah, Fireball, but there's the Counterspell, right? Counterspell taking care of the Fireball, passing the turn. So, despite the fact, of course, that Vil is drawing more, way more cards with the Gem Day Tome, he's really, really in trouble. There's a Mox Sapphire, just a lot of mana sources for Vil here. I mean, he can use the Chaos Sword, because when you flip on the Sedge and you hit him, he has to tap the Setch because when you regenerate, you tap it. So a scenario that could happen here is that he plays the Chaos Orb, then in the turn of Geisbert activates it, then in response Geisbert is going to make a regeneration shield on the Setch. And I mean, it's not a good play, you know, because you're not killing the Setch and you're losing your orb, but it's better than dying. You're on three, so I guess it is a good play actually, because you want to survive and one more turn can make the difference. He can also do this, of course, Divine Offering. On his own fell, we're gonna go up to five. That's probably better, actually. So this buys him another turn. There's the attack, putting him on two. I really wonder what card he's drawn. If it's a bolt, is it a side blast? Maybe no. It's a surrender of freet from revise. So we've got that different art. The art of the if biff of freet was printed on the surrender of freet in the revise expansion. So three four flyer, one damage a turn. But he can use the Chaos Orb for that, that doesn't matter. His problem here is the Setch Troll. Can he find a balance, for example? That would be great, he can get rid of both creatures. There's a Sarah Angel, okay, that's something. If he plays the Sarah and he doesn't survive though, oh, that's a problem. He's on two life, remember, so he can do Chaos Orb. What's that third card in hand? It's a Recall. He doesn't have enough mana, because he can recall for one, get back, yeah, can get back to swords, but he doesn't have enough mana to play and the Chaos Orb and the swords. If he had some more mana sources, oh man. Anyway, a victory here in game one for Geisbert, and Geisbert's deck doing what it wants to do and doing what I expected it to do in this matchup, be the aggressor. So despite the active GM they told him for, uh, for Sadi, all the cards he could draw with that, it wasn't enough because the pressure just kept coming from Geisbert, a really interesting game number one and now we're gonna let these players sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game number two.
Game number two, here we go with Veal on the play. Look at him go there, starting with a Mox Sapphire and an Island. I love this opening, being a blue mage myself, because it gives you access to that counter spell, right? It's just a good feeling, put some early pressure on him. Look at this, Gijsberg just starting with an underground C past the turn. This is a much more relaxed start for, uh, for Veal here in this match. There we saw Strip Mine taken back to his hand. There's the City of Brass instead. So no mana ramping happening here from Gijsberg. Remember in game one he was able to put some early pressure on. Look at this, he's missing a land drop. Now this is interesting information for Gijsberg. I exactly, I would be tempted to strip one of his sources here. Of course I don't know the rest of his hand. Remember three is really this magic number for Gijsberg. He's passing the turn. I would be tempted here because he missed a land drop to take care of the Tundra. But then again, I don't have access to his hand. Ooh, this is interesting, a strip mine on the side of Veal as well. Let's see if Gijsbert can make a land drop here. He can, there's another City of Brass. Is he gonna kind of play into a counter spell, right? That's kind of the decision that Gijsbert now has to make. He's gotta, when he plays something out, he's gotta take into account that probably Veal has a counter spell. So he's waiting for Veal here to maybe play out a creature or a gem day tome that he has an opening. Or a moment where Veal only keeps two blue open so he can strip one. And now he's going for it, playing a set troll. Are we gonna see a counter spell here? Yeah, there's the counter spell. So I'm sure Gijsbert thought, okay, now I'm gonna trade. I don't need to take any damage. I still got two blue open to counter myself. I can respond to whatever he does. There's a pass though. Taking a damage, it looks like he's gonna do something on end step. There's an ancestral recall. And now I understand the set uh, troll play even better because you know you play the set, you kind of lure out that counter spell. That is that's exactly what happened. And then you get to draw three cards with your ancestral recall. So this is good magic by uh, Gijsbert here. So drawing three cards, and of course drawing a card for turn. So that's a lot of cards for him. Tapping, playing a soul ring. Tapping four here, gonna take a damage. What are we gonna see? Maybe a Juzam Jin. that would be sweet. There is a Juzam Jin. so the 5-5 five, five powerhouse. I mean, Veal probably has answers to this. There's a Wrath in hand, I think. Is that a Wrath there? Going for the Swords. Makes sense, if you got a Swords and a Wrath, of course you're gonna Swords and End Step. And that's one of the things that, that is so nice when you've got a moat and a Wrath of God, because when you play the moat and your opponent doesn't have a lot of flyers and all the creatures are just land creatures, they're gonna all be, be kind of stuck on the board, you know, and you can wait for the perfect moment to play out your Wrath of God. Anyway, look at this, tapping six, Mahamoti Jin. I love this play, but there's a red elemental blast coming from the sideboard, but I do love this aggression by Veal. It's a big risk though because he is tapping out. He's really kind of inviting Gijsbert now to do whatever. And remember, Gijsbert has the card advantage in this match because of that uh, successful Ancestral Recall and he was on the draw, of course. But it was nice. I was actually thinking that he was gonna try to cast a Brain Geyser, but it was a Mahamoti Jin. It was really cool to see. So I think one of the names I can give the deck of, of Veal is, is the deck with muscles. Something like that, because I really like those uh, Sarah Angels and Mahamotis in there. There's a strip on the Library of Alexandria there. Tapping five. There's Sulkanar, the Swamp King. So the five, five. It's looking pretty bad here for Veal. I mean, he does have that Wrath, I believe. So he can just wait, maybe just take five points of damage and, you know, kind of wait for Geisper to commit a little bit more on the board. Ooh, a mind twist in hand there. He does have a very good hand. I would try to, in that case, maybe twist here. Gonna tap, he's gonna... Ooh, he's gonna play the Sarah instead. That's so interesting. It's really interesting to see here the decisions that Veal is making. So I guess then he doesn't have a Wrath in hand. Because if I would have a Sarah, a Wrath, and a twist in hand, I would probably play the mind twist in this case. Also because Veal is still on 15, you could take a hit of 5. I mean, it's it, it's not great, but it's possible. So there's the attack, so he's gonna take the hit, gonna go to 15. And the fact that he plays out the Sarah probably means that he doesn't have a Wrath of God in hand. There's a tap of 3, there's a Setch Troll. 
really interesting. Hard to see the cards there. I wonder what it is. Attack for four first. So gonna put, I think, Geisbert on 21, because remember, there was that Swords. Oh, and 19, actually. Oh, of course, he's taking damage from his own City of Brass. Yeah, that makes sense. But he also got five life because of the Swords on the Juzam. I wonder what cards he's got in hand, because it's just not looking great for Veal here because of that Soul Canard the Swamp King. And of course, he's going to turn the Soul Canard sideways, also attacking here with the Setch. Possibly, because of course he can block here on the Sarah, but that means three damage on the Angel. If he now has a Bolt, for example, he can kill the Angel. I wonder if that's going to happen. Tapping four. Okay, he's going to play Hypnotic Spectre. Passing to turn. I mean, if that is a Wrath, that would be, you know, attack first and then Wrath, that would be great. Exactly, I would first attack, because now he's getting a lot of value. So maybe the Sarah was there to lure more creatures out. There's the Wrath of God. So probably the Sarah Angel was cast to lure more creatures out of the, in the hand of Gijsberg. Maybe it's nice, uh, Vio, if you could let us know what your thought process was there. I'm quite interested in that. There's the play of the Setch Troll. There's a Mana Drain taking care of that. Remember, he still has that Mind Twist in hand. But the hand of Vio is almost empty, though. There's a Nevenerl's Disc. Disc, of course, works great with the Setch Trolls in the deck of Gijsbert. It's also great to get rid of artifacts when you're playing with these colors. You do have red, of course, with Shatter, but still, you know, it also takes care of enchantments, I guess. There's a Disenchant, though. And now we kind of see Veal has got some control over the game. And he's still on 10, which is actually pretty high. I mean, that Wrath was huge, because that was a... He took care of three creatures with one card. Of course, he lost his own Sarah, though, but... There we see a Time Walk being played by Gijsbert, so just taking an extra turn. Basically cycling away the time walk. That's not what you want to do, but sometimes you just have to. Yeah, this is ideal, right? He can just attack every time. There we see a shatter, though. No counter magic. Now he's in his second main. What's he going to do? I believe I see... Is that a, a card is in hand? It's hard to see. I think there's a land in there and something else. And Gijsbert just passing the turn. So both players kind of in top decking mode. They ran out of fuel. Would be nice to see a time twister here or a Wheel of Fortune. That would definitely bring back some energy in the game. I think for, for Veal here, things are going pretty well. There's a Sengir. I'm expecting an answer. Or not, of course. Ooh, control magic in hand. Does he have a control magic? And can he back it up with counter magic? That would be ideal for him. There's the control magic. There we're going to see the mana drain on the control magic. He does have a balance in hand. He could cast a balance. He's passing instead. I think he's thinking, you know what? I'm just going to take some damage. No, he is playing the balance. I thought he passed there for a moment. But he is playing the balance. Two cards in hand. So he's going to lose this thing here to the balance. It's not... I mean, I understand the balance play, but it's not too bad for Gijsbert. I mean, one of the lines of play that Veal could have done here was first play the balance, maybe lure out the counterspell, and then play the control magic. There is the Surrender Pafrit here and the passing of the turn. So some more pressure from Gijsbert. Gijsbert is playing a very creature-heavy deck, of course. Having two Sangiers, Shiva and Juzam. I think he's got six, 19 creatures in his deck. So that's pretty big, especially in old school. So here we see him taking another damage. Going to go to 11. He's attacking here for three. 
and playing out Chaos Orb. But this GM they told maybe it's gonna save him. And he's gonna flip here on the tome, of course. That makes sense. Let's see if he's gonna hit. Yep, that's a hit. Very controlled, Geisbert. Very controlled. Taking care of the tome. It's looking pretty good here for Geisbert. You know, Veal was stabilizing. But Geisbert had some good draws. Just have he just has a lot of creatures in his deck and they put pressure on, on Veal. He's on seven at the moment. Looks like he's gonna do something. Tapping three. Play a mind twist for two. So at least taking care of the hand. Look at that, just two lands gone. There's the attack for two, makes sense. Gonna put him on nine. At least put some pressure on. And a time walk. Okay, that's not too shabby. He can attack again, put him on seven. Then both players are on seven. This is really a nice game. And look at this, he's gonna do something else. Tapping five, six. Oh, what's he gonna do? A huge brain geyser, perhaps, keeping two open to counter. Yeah, oh, this is great. Geisbert making a joke there, saying, oh, you want me to draw a card? Sure, I'll do it. But this could be give back the, the game here. Look at that, swords in hand. Wow, I think I think Veal is back now, and I think Veal's gonna win the game because of this Brain Geyser. Time walking to Brain Geyser, that was just what Veal needed, passing the turn. I really, really enjoyed this game too. There's the Hypnotic Spectre in the pass. I mean, he's got, right? He can just swords. He can continue to attack with the factory. Look at the life total of Geisbert now. It has gone up, though. He's on 14 again. There's the maze. I mean, this is perfect, right? All of a sudden, Veal is completely back in the game. I think the only thing that he's got to worry about is a potential direct damage spell, like a fireball for seven. That is something that he needs to worry about. He can keep counter magic up though. There is a factory. There is of course a strip mine on the factory that makes perfect sense. Attacking again, putting Geisbert on 10. So both players knowing what they do, want to do and need to do. There's the pass again by Geisbert. There's the attack again. Ooh, gonna drop to eight. Oh, it's not looking good for Geisbert. Are we gonna see a game three here? I mean, there were moments in the game where I really thought that Geisbert was going to have it. But the time walk and Brain Geyser, that was just the moment in the game. Ooh, Demonic Tutor, though. Ho, <laughs> Demonic, I like this. Is he going to tutor for, like, Fireball, or is he going to tutor for a draw seven? Oh, man. Or for something else. I mean, the thing is, if you go for a Fireball, it, it's so risky. Because, you know, Veal's got four cards in hand. He's probably got a counterspell in there. It's so risky. But if he doesn't have the counterspell, you know, you can win the game. The downside, though, of, of a fireball is it also will... You need another turn, right? You need to untap the mana. You need all your mana to play a fireball for seven. He does have enough mana, though. So he, he could just make it. I really wonder what he's going to pick. And look, look at his library, by the way. It's very thin. There's a Mox Ruby. I mean, he still missed. I mean, if he picked a Fireball, he just doesn't have enough mana yet. Brain Geyser. Okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Does take a damage from his city. Gonna go to seven. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like a Brain Geyser is a one-sided wheel. I guess that's that's the right choice, actually. That's the right choice. For some reason, I wasn't thinking about the Brain Geyser. I think I would have done the Brain Geyser as well. Because the fireball is just too risky that he has an answer to that. You know, I'm, I'm quite sure he's got a, a counterspell in hand. Although, trying to look into his hand, it looks like he's got a lot of lands in there, so maybe he doesn't. We got a quick peek there. What did we see? Some lands? It wasn't, wasn't looking all that great. One, one bolt, maybe, so he can bolt the factory. Okay, there's the Seng here. Remember, Veal does have that maze of if. I think if you're Veal, this must be tempting now to just, if you have a bo uh, swords, to swords the, the vampire here and attack for two again. Yeah, there's the Wrath. Okay. This is actually quite good for Geisbert because I think he's got a, uh, a bolt there. 
No, he doesn't. Oh, I thought he had a bold in hand. He doesn't. He's, now he has three life. Oh, Geisbert. Oh, oh, oh. oh, what he really needed was just really a great uh, brain geyser, right? Just to find the cards he needed. It's not happening, though. He's on a one. But it ain't over until it's over. And what an exciting game number two between these two players. Really, really nice to look at. Geisbert, come on, find something. I don't want this game to end. No, it's over. It's over. He's saying you got this one. But man, this was a fun and swingy game number two. I loved it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the final decisive game here between these two players. Game number three. Game number three. Here we go. So Geisbert on the play. It's 1-1. The decisive game at the top eight of the Often Troll Cup. And, ooh, this is a great starting for Geisbert. Starting with the Library of Alexandra. Strip mine done. It's water under the bridge. So we're starting over, I guess. There's an underground sea and a pass. Let's see what Veal can do here. There's a city. So both players kind of starting off slow. Remember, they have access. I believe they play with the Moxon in their deck, you know. The... Uh, the Black Lotus, and there we see an Hypnotic Spectre turn two with a jet. That's quite good. I am, of course, expecting a Swords here. Yeah, there is the Swords. Again, doing it main because of that counter potential counter magic on the side of Geisbert, so I think it's a good decision. You shouldn't take the risk, you know. If he has a counter spell, counters away your Swords. Ooh, this is good. Juzam Jin. Geisbert doing what Geisbert is good at, just putting a lot of pressure on. We see Spirit Link there, probably a card coming in from the sideboard. Felwer Stone into Spirit Link, question mark. Tapping City, taking damage. Playing that Spirit Link. Interesting that he's choosing not to tap the Felwer. Oh, that's because Geisbert doesn't have any white mana, of course. And there's no City of Brass on the side of Geisbert there. So he had to tap a City of Brass, but this is perfect. This is a perfect answer from, uh, from Veal. To that Juzam. <laughs> Look at this. He's just passing. Wow. I mean, this is great news for Veal because he's also gaining life from the Juzam. Even if it's not attacking. He's got a Sarah in hand. The question is, does he want to tap out? Probably doesn't. Or he's doing it, though. Playing out Sarah Angel. I do like his style. It's quite aggressive. There's the Mana Drain, though. That means five extra mana this turn for Geisbert. What can he do with five extra mana? Maybe a huge fireball? It's not ideal, but you can do it. And we see that Veal is now back on uh, on 20. There is a Sengir Vampire, so he only has to pay two black because he's still at the five mana floating from the mana drain. And remember, we are playing according to the Swedish old school rules. That means there is no mana burn. Making mana drain slightly better. If there would have been mana um, burn, though, he could have used that mana to pump into his Mishra's factory, by the way. He would see a Jam Day Tome. There's a Shatter, though, as an answer. Mana Drain. Ooh, so both players finding their counter magic, and this is a really good Mana Drain. Doesn't mean that Veal is tapped out, though, so there's a little opening for Geisbert, but, you know, a Jam Day Tome can win you the game. There's the attack for four, so it's putting Veal on 15. There's a Brain Geyser. Yeah, perfect timing by Geisbert. Because of the fact that Veal is completely tapped out, there's a Batlands and a pass. So if next turn, you know, Geisbert can put some more pressure on. And I think Veal needs to remember to take life. Of course, not in his own turn, but when he passes the turn, because that could be quite decisive here in this matchup. That one life that you get each turn. Look at that, tapping everything. Also finding a Brain Geyser. No Red Elemental Blast from Geisbert here. That would have been great for him, but there's no Red Elemental Blast. So again... A really good Brain Geyser. Well, actually, I can't see the cards, but what I mean with good is just he's drawing a lot of cards. Look at that. Drawn five cards off of his Brain Geyser. Remember game two. Brain Geyser there was decisive for the victory for Veal. He can swing in here, of course. Also animating the factory swinging in for six. Put him here on eight. And 18 life still for Geisberg, putting more pressure on. I think Veal really needs a Wrath of God. That would be ideal. Okay, it destroys his own Spirit Link, but who cares? Does have one Swords in hand. Does have a Demonic Tutor, I believe. So he could tutor for a Wrath. 
Does he want to, though? Because that's going to cost him basically all his mana to do that, right? Tutor for two. Yeah, that's going to cost him all his mana. Then he cannot use a gem they told. He cannot counter. He's going to tap two. We do see this demonic tutor. And then I wonder what he's going to tutor for. Are we going to see a counter spell here? No counter spell on the side of Geisbert. Remember, Geisbert, of course, has already played out his uh, mana drain. What is he going to look up? I mean, a Wrath would make sense, right? And I guess if he plays the Wrath, he still has one mana open, because I believe he's got a Swords in hand too, so he can then Swords the Mishra's Factory next turn, if Geisbert animates the Factory. I wonder, if he if he chose a Wrath, he's probably going to play it now, right? He's not going to wait. But maybe he picked something else. He is tapping four, though, taking another damage from his own city. Gonna go to seven. Are we gonna see a Wrath of God? Oh, there's a Moat! Again, a card I didn't think about. Moat's gonna stop the Setch, it's gonna stop the Juzem, and he can, yeah, he can plow away the Sengir. So, yeah, Moat makes sense. I actually thought that maybe after game one, what I said in the deck deck, that maybe he would board it out because of all the flyers on, uh, on the side of Geisbert. But boy, was I wrong. And this Moat is really good right now. Because it's going to stop all those creatures. And now Geisbert has got to rebuild again. Going to find a Sheevan Dragon. That's actually a perfect answer. And remember, Vila stepped out again. So there's no counter possibility for him. We do know that he plays with Control Magics though. So it would be really sweet for him to Control Magic the Sheevan. Does have a balance in hand. That balance is quite good as well. Sarah Angel in hand too. He could play Balance Dana Sarah. But only one card in hand, of course, here for Geisbert. We are going to see the Balance. So Vila's got to discard too, you know. That's, that's actually pretty rough. Look at the lands as well here. 2, 4, 7 on the side of Geisbert. 2, 4, 7 on the side of Vila. Ooh, we had a Control Magic in hand, I believe. Jam Day Tome is going. Oh, we had a Counterspell in hand. Counterspell is going. And he's playing a Sarah Angel now. Oh, I do like it. Sarah Angel and Moat next to each other. That kind of makes sense to me. I love that. I think it looks really, really nice. There's the pass. Ooh. He could hit for four here. Geisbert dropping to 17. I really, really enjoy this top eight. Gem Day Tome activation here. It's looking really good for Veal. There's a pass. Oh, Ancestral Recall, this is brutal. I think this Recall could be a game changer. Does Geisbert have, he does. Okay, Red Elemental Blast, okay, that's something. I do understand that, you know, Geisbert is hesitant because Vil already has this huge card advantage with that Jam Day Tome. Another attack by the Sarah, by the way. Geisbert dropping to 13, tapping four here. There's a Nevenerals disc. This disc is great. If there's no, Answer to the disc, this is fantastic for Geisbert. This can get him back in. Are we gonna see a disenchant on a disc? Oh wow, this is great news for Geisbert. This is what he needed. And I would activate it main, why? Because you don't wanna give Veal another uh, chance to use his gem Dito. That's the only reason. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't wanna give him another card. You just don't wanna do that. So destroying the board of Veal here, attacking him for two as well. Look at his life total. He's on three. There's a time walk. Oh, ho, 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 this is huge. He could put him on one. He could put him on one here. Oh, man. Playing. Yes. Now he can pump it up. Attacking, pumping it up to a 3-3. Winning here. Wow. What an amazing, amazing ending to this match. I mean, that Nevenerals Disc activation, the time walk. I almost forgot that Veal was so low. You know, he got to three, then the time walk, then he top decked the Mishra's factory, being able to pump his factory, killing him, putting him exactly on zero. This is what I love about old school magic. What a great matchup. Thank you, Veal, and thank you, Geisbert, for uh, showing your skills here on Timmy Talks on the live stream and now on the YouTube channel. Thank you guys so, so much. This is absolutely epic.
Oh, I love it. And the good news is maybe we're going to see Gijsbert back later in the series because he's advancing to the semi-finals. So if you want to see more action from this tournament, please check out Timmy Talks. If you're not a subscriber yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Oh man, and if you are a subscriber, absolutely fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed this match as much as I did. Please don't forget to like, share, and comment. All these things are free and they really help the channel move forward. Talking about helping the channel move forward, I also have my very own Patreon page on patreon.com slash timmytalks. And there you can find out how you can support the channel financially. So if you like the content that I make, you can support me as a content creator by visiting patreon.com slash timmytalks. The support already starts with just $1 a month. Oh man, oh boy, what a great match. I just need, you know, I'm just gonna... Take a cup of coffee now and gonna take a moment to relax from this great match. Thank you very much uh, for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And I'll see you next time. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomaar gezien.